And today we talk about Peter's denial. Peter's denial of the Lord. Why does John focus so much on Peter's denial of the Lord? Why did the Lord allow Peter to deny him? It's going to be a great message today. Think to yourself, have you ever denied the Lord? Have you ever denied the Lord? Have you ever had an opportunity where you could step out and speak for the Lord and your tongue somehow couldn't get past your lips? Or you walked away? Or you pass by the opportunity and you walk away kicking yourself, God, why didn't I say something? Or that you held your tongue because you didn't want somebody to look at you in a particular way. Oh, I don't want to bring it up there. Or I don't want conflict to happen. Or I don't want people to not like me. Or whatever the reason why. So think about that as we talk about the message today. Think about your own life. Have you denied him? And will you deny him in the future? What are your thoughts about that? So we're going to talk about that today. Psalm 84. Psalm 84. Another beautiful psalm. This psalm. In my Bible, the headline of the psalm is the joy of dwelling with God. How many of you look at your life and say it's filled with joy because you know the Lord is with you? How many people of you say <laughs> that you have joy in the Lord because the Lord is with you? Amen. Amen. He is, and what a great joy it is to know that he is with us. As the men talked about yesterday, the Lord is near. In any trial, in any struggle, in any tribulation, he is near. The word of the Lord from Psalm 84. How lovely are thy dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. The bird has found a house and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. How blessed are those who dwell in thy house. They are ever praising thee. How blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, whose heart are the highways to Zion. Passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The early rain covers it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God, and look upon the face of thine anointed. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in thee. The word of the Lord. And Lord, we do shout for joy. We do bless your name. We do thank you for all, all the joyous celebrations that we have within us. And even though we go through difficult times, even though we go through struggle, even though we go through trial, we go through tribulation, we deal with age, we deal with weakness, we deal with lack of strength physically. May we never lack strength spiritually in you because you are the joy of our heart and your spirit guides us. And one day, Across that other shore, we will see you face to face when spiritual life and physical life join together and we gaze at you and can experience joy eternal, joy that will never end. 
Let us practice that joy here. Even in the midst of trial, may we practice joy and may we celebrate in joy and may we sing for joy because you are our God and King and we love you, Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, so no children's church today, we want to start with the reading, reading of the word from John 18, verses 12 to 27. The word of the Lord. So the Roman cohort and the commander and officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him and led him to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man to die on behalf of the people. Simon Peter was following along, and so was another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest, and it entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Then the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of these, this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there, having made a charcoal fire, for it was cold. And they were warming themselves, and Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have taught in synagogues and in the temples, where all the Jews have come together. I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them, and they know what I said. And when he had said this, one of the officers standing nearby struck Jesus, saying, Is that the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered and said, If I have spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? So Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. When the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. And may the Lord bless the reading of his word and its exposition today, Lord, that we might know what to take from this and apply it to our lives. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we talked about Jesus' arrest, or the beginning of Jesus' arrest. Jesus had come to the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciple. He had been doing that very often. And so it was a known place to him, and Judas shows up there with an entire Roman cohort. And a commander, it says here, was there with them, a commander of a thousand troops. And so this large scene of Romans show up, and also the temple police are there, and they come and they ask for who Jesus was. Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss. We learned that in the other Gospels. And we went through that passage, and John's focus in that passage was not so much of the narrative of the, of the events of that, but that Jesus did two things. He said, who are you looking for? And then he told them that he was the I Am, and they all bowed down. Because when the Lord speaks and says, I, in the name of God... People bow down. And what a, a beautiful picture of what Paul is teaching in Philippians 2, that every knee shall bow and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is the future. And that is a microcosm of what the future will be like in Revelation 19 when he comes back. But there was one other thing he meant by saying, who are you looking for? And he wanted to protect his disciples he was going to be the only one that was taken. And he assured by asking what the charge was against him 
that the others would be able to go free, and he demanded that the others would go free. And as we come into the scene today, the next few verses in this story, we learn a lot about John's perspective of these events. What's important to John in these events? The other three Gospels talk about this passage the same way. The other three Gospels talk about Peter's denial. There's slight differences in the, in the story, but they all come together like a painting of a picture with a little black and a little red and a little green and a little yellow, and you kind of get the whole palette in use as you look at how this story unfolds. People who say, well, you know, these two versions conflict. Matthew's version conflicts with Luke's version. Only have to look deeply in there and dive into it before you realize that that's not true. They just add different aspects of it. And as I shared last week, each of the gospel writers wrote with a particular audience in mind and a particular theme in mind. And so you see subtle differences. But John does something here that none of the other gospel writers do. He has this interaction with Annas. Other gospels have an interaction with Caiaphas and the whole Sanhedrin that came together, the, the final Jewish trial that convicted Jesus. John doesn't even talk about that. Why is John talking about this interaction with Annas that the other ones do not. And as we unfold that for us, we can see why that is the case. But before we get there, how do you reconcile that Peter denies the Lord? How do you reconcile in your mind that Peter denied the Lord? Can a believer deny the Lord? Can a believer, when faced with the challenge, can he deny the Lord? This event and this crowing of a rooster has been something that's taught through the ages. And it's been taught various ways. There was a pope named Nicholas I in the ninth century who was so overwhelmed by this idea that a believer could deny the Lord he instituted something. And he said on the top of the roof of every Catholic church, I want a rooster. I want to put a rooster on the top of the church so that anybody who walks in the church will see a rooster and remember this story that Peter had. Remember what he went through. So powerful was that. And so what did the Catholic churches do? They said, I'm going to put a rooster up there. And they decided to put a weather vane and a rooster on top of the weather vane because it's got to have some other purpose. If you go to the Vatican in St. Peter's Basilica and you walk into that great area where this huge, magnificent cathedral is there, you will see a rooster on top of the great St. Peter's Basilica. Our number one gas station in town, right? Casey's, you know what their logo is? It's a weather vane with a rooster on it. You download your app, you can see that. I go into Casey's and I say, hey, you guys know why there's a rooster for your, you know, your logo for your business? No idea. Oh, now you can tell the story. The story is Peter's denial and the reason why we have that image in our mind when we go into a Catholic church or visit a Casey's is we want to remember his denial. And how do we reconcile that with our own life? Well, you may remember in Matthew 26, you may remember the, the beginning part of this story. Peter, in verses 31 to 35 of Matthew 26, hears Jesus say, You will all fall away from me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and all of the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. The Lord is saying, everyone will leave him. No exception. But Peter said to him, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. What a bold statement. 
Maybe many of you could utter that line where you are in your life right now. Even if everybody else in the congregation will fall away, Kent might say, I will never fall away from you, Lord. What a bold, bold statement. From that emotional high of that bold statement, Jesus looks straight at him and says, Truly I say to you, this very night before a rooster crows, you will deny me not once, not twice, but three times. Peter, not wanting to hear that from the Lord, says, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all of the disciples said the same thing too. His crew, they will not deny him. How bold of a statement is that? And so I ask you the question, now you guys know in the story, how'd that work out for him? <laughs> how'd that play out in his life? This very night, <laughs> when Jesus utters this line to the fact that Peter denies him three times, got to be less than a five-hour period of time. His bold commitment lasted five hours, Regina. <laughs> five. <laughs> five hours. How do we understand that? He denied the Lord three times. You remember Matthew 10? Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33, the Lord's statement on discipleship. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny him before my Father who is in heaven. You deny me before men, I'm going to deny you before my Father who is in heaven. Did the Lord deny Peter before the Father in heaven? Because he obviously denied the Lord three times. Is there any way back from that? From that denial? Of course there is. Oh, come to the altar, right? We sang that song. Open wide. Forgiveness is found in the person of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful song to sing about recovery from loss. Why did the Lord allow Peter to have a bold statement? Why did the Lord allow Peter to deny him three times? Why three? We will see that coming in, the, in future weeks. We'll actually hit a whole sermon topic about the reason why this event happens in Peter's life. How many of you have a concern that you will once deny the Lord? Anybody concerned that if a gun was put to you and say, deny the Lord, or take your seat on the floor because I'm going to kill you? Anybody think that they would shrug down, protect their own life in moments like that? Would you cower away? Would you run? What would you do? Any concerns? I had a guy in this church a couple of years ago who said, you know what, if I'm honest, if I'm honest, if I was in that situation, I don't know what I would do. I really don't. I don't know what I would do. And it's okay if you don't know what you would do. But I know what you would do. I know what you would do if the Spirit of the Lord is in you. I know exactly what you would do. Fire away, big man. <laughs> you, want me, you want help loading the gun? <laughs> I'll give you some help loading the gun. I'll take a bullet for my Lord. He took a bullet for me on the cross. Right? Greater love has no man than this, that a man would do what? Lay down his life for his friends? He did that as Don prayed. We should never lose sight of that. Well, last time we looked at Judas bringing this army together, so let's get into this text. There's a trial scene, or a Jewish trial scene, that I have in the notes, and it's those first three verses where John records that a Roman cohort was there and a commander of the officers was there and they arrest Jesus and they bound him and they take him to this guy named Annas. We don't know a whole lot about Annas. The other Gospels don't talk about Annas. But what we do know is that there was a Jewish trial and then there was a Roman trial. 
The Romans, when they came into Jerusalem and took over in, into Jerusalem, allowed the Jews to do certain things, and they didn't allow the Jews to do certain things. The Jews could have a trial according to their laws, but they did not have the power to execute in Rome. They did not have the power to kill. They weren't allowed to do that. And so what could they do? They could try according to their own laws, and then they had to go into a Roman trial if the result or judgment of the trial was execution. You probably remember there was a guy named Stephen. And in the early chapters of Acts, Stephen took a few stones, <laughs> actually killed Stephen. There's a note in there that his life was taken by stones. That's a Jewish execution method. Why didn't they go through a Roman trial? They made perfectly clear that they didn't want to do it where the Romans were around. But that's not the case with Jesus. They wanted everything done by the book. And so they take him to Annas. What do we know about Annas? Annas was the high priest in Jerusalem for about 10 years, from A.D. 6 to 15. His family was a line of priests. And after he was removed, Pilate's predecessor, a guy named Valerius Gratus, removed him because there were complaints about Annas. He was too rough. He was an evil man. He was partial. And so the guys removed him from office because there were a lot of complaints about Annas. And so what did Annas do? He put his sons in charge. And there's a succession of five sons that filled this role for a while. But you know when your sons fill the role, you know daddy is still around. And people viewed Anna still as the high priest. And then the sons had enough of that role, and then so Annas has to assign a guy named Caiaphas, which was his son-in-law, to be able to fill the role. But like the good old boy network that we know and know well, there's a good old boy network from the priestly line, and Annas is the top dog of that. And so he gets Jesus's first audience with somebody in authority, and Annas has to deal with Jesus. Annas being a guy like he was, an evil guy that he was, he didn't really follow all of the rules. He tended to create his own rules. I'm sure you can remember many leaders in history that like to create their own rules. They don't want to follow the, the, follow the law. They want to be a law unto themselves. It doesn't take that long to look across the globe now that there are a lot of people who are like that with puppet governments that would put rule in place. And Annas was one of these guys. So Caiaphas had an interesting role with Jesus because they're trying to figure out the Sanhedrin was, the Jewish Supreme Court, 71 members. When Jesus comes into town, they, he stirs up a lot of activity. And it's coming... In, during the time of Passover where the city would swell by so much and the Romans were all concerned about having order during this time of festival, they brought armies in and sat them up in the temple area, the north part of it called the Antonio Forest, and they were watching the, over the city. Caiaphas, with Jesus in play, said to the Sanhedrin, you know, if we kill this one guy... It's better that he dies than that the Romans take everything away from us. And he prophetically said that Jesus was going to die for his people. And that's why John records this, that Caiaphas was the one who advised the Jews that it was expedient for one to die rather than the whole nation or all the people would die. What do we know about Caiaphas? We know that he wasn't really a strong man. He was a little weak in his efforts to control. You know how it is when your father-in-law is the top guy in town. And he wasn't exactly passive, but he wasn't really forceful. He was kind of in the middle of this. And so Annas has the beginning of the Jewish trial. And it is at night. And so what does Annas do with Jesus? That becomes the question. But before we get to that part of it, John goes into Peter's reaction first. 
And you'll see similar passages to this in Mark chapter 14, in Luke 22, in Matthew 26. There are different aspects of this scene. Why does John record this in this particular way? There are things that John says in here that are different than any other place. So in John 18, 15 to 18, as I read earlier, Simon Peter is following Jesus, and so is another disciple. That disciple is John. John doesn't like to mention his name, never mentions his name in the gospel. And he says that the disciple was known to the high priest. And he entered with Jesus into the court of the priest. And Peter was standing outside. We learn from this that John is connected. John has some influence in Jerusalem. He comes to Annas. Annas knows who he is. Their families were connected. They were the highs of the highs. And it's interesting that we find these things out about John because Peter and Andrew were different types of people. We hear James and John were fishermen when the Lord calls the disciples. And yet, even as a fisherman, John's part of a family that's pretty well connected. And it's interesting what this slave girl who interacts with Peter says. He says, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? That question to Peter is whether or not you are a disciple. That word in the Greek is mathetes. It means a devoted follower. And what the Jews would do is they would send their kids over to study with the rabbi. They would live with the rabbi. There are many, many famous rabbis throughout time, especially a couple during Jesus' time, and they would send their kids, and they would be with and live with their teacher, the rabbi. And so the woman is asking a very interesting question. Are you one of his guys? Are, one, are you one of his devoted followers? Do you stay with him? Do you believe in what he is teaching? That's the question that she asks. No other gospel rec record of this event is that asked. He doesn't, they don't use that term disciple. They don't use that term devoted. If I ask you a question in the midst of a public type of an event, let's say we're over at the community center and I call you up there and I ask you the question, are you truly devoted to Jesus? And you look out amongst the audience and you see people you work with and you see people that are part of the community and people you may hang with, go fishing with, hang out at the pub with. The pressure is on. Are you devoted to him? Are you really devoted to him? All the other gospel writers just say, were you with him, like an acquaintance? But John highlights the question is whether or not you're devoted to him. And what is Peter's response? I'm not. I'm not devoted to him. I've only spent three and plus years with this guy, but I'm not devoted to him. I happen to be the one that the Father gave these words to. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Remember that from Matthew chapter 16, verse 16. And yet I am not devoted to him. What's your view of Peter? All you had to do is to say what? He's my guy. I believe in him. Why didn't he do it? Why didn't he do it? I'm denying that he has any real place in my life. I'm denying that I'm a part of him and that he is a part of me. I'm denying him completely. There was no equivocation. It's a, it's a straight word in the original language. Ain't my guy. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father who is in heaven. Was that word that Peter got all the way back a year or so earlier in his mind as he said no? How many of you are faced with a decision like that and your thought process goes back and forth really quickly? What do I say? What do I say? What do I say? Do I say something? 
Do I stand up if I'm a kid in school? If I'm a teenager? You don't believe in this Jesus stuff, do you? What goes through your mind? Oh, I can't say that, man. People won't think I'm cool. Well, you're probably not cool either. You're not cool anyway. They won't like me if I say that. What will they treat me like? Will they treat me differently? Will they not ask me to go to events? Will they exclude me? Will they excommunicate me from my clique? Will they look down upon me? Will they not like me at work? I mean, all these things could flood your mind when you're asked to stand up and say what you believe in. Why did Peter not do it? Well, let's go back to the Jewish trial a little bit here. Verses 19 to 20. Why does John record this interaction with Annas? Obviously, he knew Annas. He had connections, so he's the only gospel writer that mentions it. But maybe there's another reason. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples in verse 19 and about his teaching. And Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I've taught in the synagogues and the temples where all the Jews have come together. I spoke nothing in secret. Jesus is not some false teacher. He's not somebody trying to pull you away. He's not pulling the disciples away. He doesn't have this secret engagement area. There's no secret vows or secret, secret oaths. He's straight out preaching in the synagogues where everybody can hear him and everybody can see him. We call that transparency. He is transparent in his message. There's a reason why, as I was saying on Wednesday night, every message we preach here goes up on the web. Every set of notes I teach from goes up on the web. Transparency, right? There's nothing that happens in secret. He's not hiding. He wasn't a cult leader. It's interesting that when Paul followed along, he followed the same pattern of this. Paul spoke about his ministry in Colossians 1, 25 to 27. He says, Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is the mystery which has been revealed that was hidden in the past ages and generation now being manifested to his saints. He says, I follow along that same ministry pattern. And when Paul started his missionary journeys, his first destination in any town. If there was a synagogue, he was showing up in it. He was teaching there. It was out in the open. In the times where there was not a synagogue around, he would go where the marketplace was. He would go to the river if everybody congregated around the river. The message is out in the open. There's nothing hidden. It's no secret. Why is that important to be transparent? Why does Jesus tell Annas, you know what, everything I do is out in the open. Where is Jesus right at that point? Is it out in the open? Is it in a courtroom? No. He's in a house of the judge. And it's at night. It's all secret. <laughs> and yet he's talking about, look dude, when I talk, it's not like this scene. When I talk, it's out in the open. Everybody can hear what I'm saying. But now we're cowered into this little room outside of your house in this courtyard area, etc. And we're having this conversation here in the middle of the night. People are warming themselves outside. It's freezing. The press is not there. Nobody has taken record of this event at all. How different I am than you. If you were a real high priest, what would you do? You would do this in the light of day, right? You would have an opportunity for everybody to see what you're doing, but you, dude, you're a little underhanded. Your reputation precedes you, and here's another event where you're doing this on the down low. Only John records this. So Jesus continues with Annas, verses 21 and 22. It's saying, why do you question me? Boy, talk about a slap to the judge. I, I advise you to go to the judge the next time you're in a courtroom and say, who do you think you are? And see how that plays out for you, 
right? <laughs> who do you think you are? Why are you questioning me? What does he say? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them so that they, they know what I said. And when he said this, one of the officers standing nearby struck Jesus and says, is that the way you answer the high priest? You know, you go attack a judge in the middle of his courtroom and the bailiff may come over and have something to say with you, right? <laughs> and this is the scene. You're doing this on the down low. You're not in secret. Why are you questioning me? What is Jesus asking? You know, in a normal Jewish trial, and we've got those rules in the United States of America as well, what are you allowed to have? Witnesses. <laughs> Where is your accuser? Where are the people who are saying that, that, that I've said things that are somewhat evil, that are not right? Where, where's your guys? You don't have anybody. So you have Jesus knowing the court system well, knowing the rules, the legal rules very well, saying not only are you an evil individual, not only are you doing this in secret at night, you are also not even following the basic premise that a guy should be able to have witnesses and you have nobody here to accuse me of this. And of course, the judge didn't want to hear that. And so he probably had a hand signal to one of his henchmen. And one of his henchmen decided to strike Jesus. Verses 23 and 24. Jesus answered him and said, If I've spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? Why are you not following the rules? Why are you mistreating me when there's been no accusation against me at all that has been brought in front of this, quote, tribunal, this secret meeting? Annas realizes a couple of things. One, Jesus knows the law. And he is his own lawyer at this place. He knows the law, and they're not following it. And the other thing that he knows is Jesus is not going to be bullied. He's not going to kowtow to the authority of the great high priest, Annas. Where everybody else in Jerusalem may kowtow to this guy, Jesus is not going to kowtow to this guy. He's going to follow the law. And when I deal with people who are believers, and they're in a legal situation somewhere, He's like, well, you know, I don't want to sue somebody because, yeah, you know, that's probably not what a Christian should do. Jesus took advantage of the law. Paul took advantage of the law. There's nothing wrong with making your case toward the law. There's only one caveat to that, right? And Paul talked about this. If you got a believer and a believer, what do you do? You settle it together like a brother and a sister, or a brother and a brother, and a sister and a sister. And he's, why take that in front of, of the, the court system when you guys should be able to work it out inside the church? But there's nothing wrong with taking advantage of the legal process. And many of you have had to deal with legal process before. In some cases, the government is not quite righteous in the way they administer justice. Justice is a joke in many cases. But that doesn't mean that we stop using legal processes for this. And so he sends him over to Caiaphas, saying, like, I'm not going to be able to bully this guy. He's calling me out one time after another for what we're doing here. He sends him bound to Caiaphas. John doesn't record this interaction with Caiaphas at all. He moves on to Peter's reaction. It's obviously that his mind is focused on Peter when he writes this. But we have Matthew's account of what happened when he gets sent to Caiaphas. We see that in Matthew 26, 59 to 66. He says, The chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death. Great justice here. We've already determined he's guilty. We already know what the punishment is going to be, so let me go find some people to figure out a sham trial so I can look like I'm following the process when I am really not. And so it says they didn't find any, even though false witnesses came forward 
Two came forward and said, the man stated, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. The high priest stood up and said to Jesus, do you not answer? Are you not going to say anything? Are you not going to comment on what these guys are saying? And it says Jesus kept silent. He didn't say anything. I'm not going to cooperate against false accusations. I'm not going to jump into these with false witnesses. This is a sham, and I know it's a sham. And so what does the high priest do in Matthew 26? He says to Jesus, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether or not you are the Christ, the Son of God. I adjure you. What does that mean? I want you to swear an oath. I want you to swear an oath to who you are. That's what he's asking Jesus to do. That's a direct question. If Jesus doesn't answer this, he could be denying his father, right? But he doesn't have to swear an oath. He doesn't have to say anything. But what does he do? He takes the opportunity to say something. If he's going to be questioned about his relationship and who he is, his relationship to the Father, his placement in the Trinity, the fact that he's the Messiah, he has an opportunity in this platform, which is a public platform, when lots of people are around and listening, when you're hauled off into a courtroom in an unjust situation and you have the opportunity to be able to proclaim Christ, how many of you would love that opportunity? If you have an opportunity to be able to say that you believe in Jesus in public, would you take that opportunity? When the question is posed to you, would you stand up in the witness chair and say, I want to proclaim Christ? Man, many of us would just love that opportunity to be able to do that. And Jesus says, you said it yourself. Translate into that common Detroit language that I know really well, Jesus is saying, you bet I am. What are you going to do about it? Are you God? You bet I am. And so what do the guys say? The high priest in verse 65 tore his robes and says, he has blasphemed. What further need do we have for witnesses? He committed himself to this, and therefore he's guilty. You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? Caiaphas looks at the other 70 guys and say, what do you think? And everybody seemingly in unison says he deserves death because Jesus told the truth. You go to a courtroom and you tell the truth and you deserve death. What kind of judgment is that? You think it's a righteous governmental system? Do you think it's possible that any innocent people can be convicted in the United States of America? No, that would never happen, would it? The wheels of justice, Lady, Lady Justice, she's not blind, is she? She's wide open eyes. She would never let that to happen. Of course so. But John doesn't want to stop there. He wants to go back to Peter. And it's the main part of this passage that we need to consider. Verses 25 to 27. Peter is standing there and warming himself. And for a second time, a guy says, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, says, did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter denied it again, and then a rooster crowed. Was Peter saved at this time? What do you think? Was he saved? Did he believe in Jesus at that point? Did he deny Christ to many people? Did he give up? his relationship to the Lord to protect himself? Did God and his plan put in place call Peter to do this? Was God behind his denial? These are great questions. We've talked about this in several different passages before. 
What happens to you when you get saved? What happens to you when you get saved? Or more importantly, who comes inside of you when you get saved? Spirit. Did Peter have the Holy Spirit at this time in his life? That didn't show up until when? Pentecost? Peter doesn't have the strength of the Holy Spirit inside him at this time. Therefore, we can understand his denial. He's still quite a natural man. Even though he's got good teaching, he's still a little bit of the natural man. We see him impulsive. We see him bursting out with commitments that he can't keep. We see great things out of him, but we don't see consistent things out of him. Peter is still a work in progress at this time of his life. You remember back into John 15? John 15, not too many chapters before, Peter heard these words from the Lord. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I am him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. You don't have a relationship with the Lord. And you don't have the strength of his indwelling spirit. You may deny the Lord. You may look at the horizontal events of the world and say, I want to face that, and you may deny him. But if you have the spirit inside of you, if the spirit runs your life, if you're committed to him in the spirit, even though now as I mention these things to you, you may say, I don't know, pastor, if I can face a gun bite. If the spirit is inside of you, you will stand because you will not deny the Lord who bought you. You will not deny the Lord because the spirit will buck you up with great strength and you will say, I know him. Fire. I'll stand for him. What does Zechariah 4 tell us? Zechariah 4, Zechariah sees this picture of two golden lampstands and two olive trees, and the olive trees are feeding the golden lampstand. And what does he hear? Zechariah, and he records in verse 6, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Zerubbabel was going to have to rebuild Jerusalem. He was going to get all sorts of people coming at him, all sorts of attacks. And what does the Lord want to say to him? at that time when he's coming back from Babylon, when Nehemiah is there building the walls, when all of the, all of the adversaries are around, and you know that from those stories, a guy named Sanballat, etc., trying to incite them to quit at their job. He wanted Zerubbabel to know, it's not by your strength, man. It's not by your power. It's by my spirit. And he was going to complete his task because the spirit of the Lord was with him. And the same goes for us when faced with that opportunity to deny Christ. The Holy Spirit will give us strength that we don't understand not to fall. But Peter at that time does not have this strength. He does not have the Holy Spirit with him. He's still very young. And so I see people... And I ask them questions in public positions. And they say they're a believer. Guy told me this weekend he believed. And I'm like, great. Would you stand up and be willing to come and stand up and tell people about that? Oh, I don't think so, Pastor. Well, I tell you, there's nobody in the church that's going to come up and rush at you, right? I mean, they'll be happy that you stand up and say that you believe in the Lord. Oh, I'm not, I'm not ready yet. I'm like, okay, well, when you're ready, let me know. When you're ready, let me know. And what am I praying for? Lord, if the Holy Spirit is with this young man, give him the strength to understand that the Spirit will allow him to come up in front of the people and proclaim, I believe in him. I believe in him. Because if the Spirit is with you, it is your strength. Paul, in his last words to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 
It's a trustworthy statement, he says. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. But if we deny him, he will deny us. And Paul is talking to Timothy about people who really aren't committed to the Lord, but they'll show up in the church. And if they continually deny the Lord, that's evidence that the Spirit does not live inside of them. And therefore, their future is to be denied by Christ. And we don't want that to happen to them. But I want to go back to the second part of this message, remorse. What was Peter feeling like after the denial? Paul, excuse me, John doesn't talk about Peter's reaction. John's focusing on the fact that Peter fulfilled the Lord's prophecy. He said that they would deny him, and they did. He prophesied, and it came to pass. Luke's version of this is a little bit different. Listen to what Luke's version is from Luke 22, 56 to 62. A servant girl, seeing Peter as he sat in the firelight, looked intently at him and said, This man was with him too, but he denied it. And he said, Woman, I do not know him. Man, what a powerful line. I don't know him. A little later, another saw him and said, You are one of them too. And Peter said, Man, I am not. After an hour passed, another man began to insist, saying, Certainly this man was with him also, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. Immediately, like right as those words just came out of Peter's mouth, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. Now Luke's gospel is written to show Jesus and his humanity. The next line, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. He is the only gospel writer that says the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Peter is in this courtyard. They're abusing the Lord in front of him. He's looking at him from a distance. He's watching what's going on. And his focus is on the Lord. And somebody comes up from the other side and says, you're one of them too, aren't you? And he says, no, I am not. I'm not, I'm not. And he looks back to the Lord, and the Lord looks at him. Can you only imagine what's going through Peter's mind at this time? As the Lord looks at Peter and, and thinks to himself, three years, man. All those times, three years. All those bold statements, three years. All those mountaintop moments over three years. And that's what you're going to say? What does Peter do? Peter remembered the word of the Lord and how he had told him before a rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. Verse 62, Luke 22, and he went out and wept bitterly. Remorse. I failed the Lord. Anybody fail the Lord out there? Anybody miss the opportunity to stand up for him in their life? Anybody miss the opportunity to make a difference for the kingdom in your life? What happens if the Lord was right there and he looked at you? How would you feel? I can't imagine what this young guy is dealing with at this point in his life. We've all denied the Lord. Maybe not directly, but passively. We've all said to ourselves, you know what, I'm not going to take the risk. I'm not going to claim to be a believer. I'm not going to stand up when people ask me because I don't, because I don't want, because I, because, 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 whatever the because is. We've all made that mistake. And for us to know the truth, and to understand the truth, to know the gospel and to understand the gospel, to celebrate at the table his sacrifice for us, and then not stand up for him. We've been there. 
But there's a time in Peter's future where restoration happens. And we're going to see that later on in the Gospel of John. We're going to see restoration because there's a way back from intermediate denial. There's no way back from final denial. Matthew's version of this, just as a matter of record, said that Peter began to curse and swear when he said, I do not know the man. He began to curse and swear. That's not like he sweared against the Lord. It's not like he cursed the Lord. That's not what he's saying. He's saying he cursed himself. How many of you heard this? I swear to God that I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. That's swearing an oath, right? As God is my witness, I do not know the man. Not only has he taken his personal denial of Christ, he raises it up to God's level. Jesus taught about that in the Sermon on the Mount and said, don't do that. <laughs> don't swear by anything like that. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Just be honest and answer the question. Don't lie. That's all he's saying. But no, Peter needs some extra juice in his last denial and began to curse and swear an oath. Interesting, isn't it? Mark's version of this, which is Peter's version of the gospel, he says similarly, a different cursing. And he says it's a negative curse, and he says, may God damn me to hell if I'm lying. In each of these passages, the reaction is remorse. Anybody, when caught in a lie, have remorse? When caught from making a mistake, you have remorse? People think that coming to the Lord requires repentance, and repentance requires remorse. Repentance requires a change in mind, a change in your mind. You know what? The Lord was right, and I was wrong. The Lord said to do this, and I didn't do this. But there's a way back from failure. This is an important message for us to our children and our grandchildren. Yeah, I try to be a good dad. I try to be a good leader. I try to be a good grandfather. I try to be a, a good example. But you know what? I'm not perfect. And I've made mistakes in my own life. And there's a way back from mistakes. Right, Coach? There's a way back. And so we need to teach that to our kids because there's a way back from Peter. And so as we go to close in prayer, the song at the end, Just As I Am, come to the altar. His arms are open wide. There's forgiveness, right? There's forgiveness. So as we play the song, if there's anything in your mind that has come during this message, anything where you feel like you've failed the Lord, anything where you feel like you've denied Him, anything where you need to come to the Lord and say, I failed. I admit it. I need your grace. I need your forgiveness. Lord, I need you. Come to the altar. We'll play the song. And Lord, I do pray. I pray for everybody in my hearing, everybody in the congregation here, everybody that would hear the message later on, Lord. Anybody that has denied Christ, anybody that has failed, anybody that has failed to recognize that you, Lord, are God and there is no other, anybody that has lied about you or lied about anything else that the altar is open for them to simply come and say I admit it I failed and know that restoration is available hear the prayer of your people hear the words of their mouth the meditations of their mind the commitment of their heart 
to you, Lord. We are not perfect. We're forgiven if we come in faith and ask for forgiveness. Work in your people today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, this is Pastor Jeffrey Plummer. I want to thank you for watching our sermon video today. Our sermon video is available on our website, which is www.cbccne.org. On that website, you will find sermon video as well as a blog that I write each week to our fellowship here at the church. At the top of the website in the corner, you can see all of those links that can get to that information. You can also learn about our church with our church history in the About page to be able to find out what we're all about here in Cambridge, Nebraska. Again, I want to thank you for watching our sermon video today, and I pray that you have a blessed day.